House Judiciary, Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are gonna be looking at S-114, which is uh, a uh, COVID response that the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee has passed. I'm not sure what action the full Senate has taken on it yet. Uh, There's some probate uh, sections that Eric will review. Um, we have reviewed, but just will refresh our memory and then we'll be hearing from Bryn. Uh, there are some sections in there that uh, hopefully Bryn can help us understand. I believe that uh, House General has looked at, but I need to, uh, I need to understand that, that better. So we'll, we'll bring that up with uh, with Brynn, unless Eric, I'm not sure if, if you have any information on that, but so, um, so hopefully people have the document or access to the document, S114. Um, okay, great. Eric, welcome. Thank yes. you. Yes, absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to talk about uh, a couple of the sections, as the chair mentioned in S114. I'm sure everyone has their own approach for how to view each other through Zoom and, and also look at a document. I don't know if, if this helps, but I actually use my iPad in front of me for Zoom while I simultaneously have the document open on my laptop. And that actually works fairly easily, but that's just one possible way to approach it. But that way uh, I'm not sort of having to toggle back and forth between the Zoom and the document on the same, on the same device. So that works pretty well. Um, old fashioned. Also, sorry, go ahead. Old fashioned. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Old school, right? I, yeah. Um, which I would do if I was sitting in committee as well. I'd like to hard copy there, but uh, I don't have one here. So, um, uh, as uh, Representative Grad mentioned, I'm just looking to discuss with you a couple of the sections, and they are sections two and three of S114. As, um, as the chair also mentioned, I believe it was Tuesday that S-114 was voted out by Senate Judiciary. And they actually received permission, the, the Rules Committee gave um, two Senate committees permission to vote out bills that day, one of whom was Senate Judiciary, and they voted this one out unanimously. Uh, it has not hit the floor yet. I know that there's a, um, I think there's a token session of the Senate today and, uh, you know, you heard they passed their passed yesterday the resolution to permit remote voting on the on the uh, by the full Senate, and so I think they're planning to take a couple of bills up tomorrow. I'm not sure if S one one fourteen is one of them yet, but it is already passed out of committee. So I think the the sense is that it's going to move pretty quickly, and even this is unusual in a sense, that also because of the COVID nineteen situation that you know House Judiciary is looking at the bill. I'm walking you through it. You're hearing witness testimony about it before it's even passed the Senate. But but the idea there again is to move things along as quickly as possible to sort of get a get a head start on it, so that uh, um, you folks have already been able to digest it, think about um, what your thoughts are on it, so that you won't be starting from scratch again and having to wait until the bill comes over from the Senate. That way, things can can get passed even more quickly than usual and more smoothly. So that's the general idea anyway. So as far as the specific Eric, Eric, yeah, sorry, I see um I see Tom's hand up. Oh sorry. It's okay. Morning, Eric. Um morning. Just real quick, uh I'm gonna assume you were uh spending time in uh Senate Judiciary on this and um uh yes. I don't know if you've heard any buzz, but is is there gonna be any amendments on the Senate floor? I, I'm gonna assume no at this point, but um just to maybe hear it from somebody that, so we're not gonna be possibly working on something um, that's gonna change. Not to my knowledge. Again, that that doesn't mean that it's not possible, I guess, right? You yep. know, I might, not, yep. I might not know about it, but uh, right. um, nothing certainly that was discussed in committee that I'm aware of. Um, okay. So, and I was down there for a good chunk of the discussion. I say down there, I was actually sitting right here at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I kind of knew that, but I just wanted to hear it out loud, I guess. Sure. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. <laughs> and that's that's my understanding as well, is that that everything is by consensus. There there was a section that, that Brink can talk to us about uh, that is out uh, because there was not agreement. I think there are actually two sections um, that are now out of the bill. 
Uh, yeah, two, but, two that I know of. Right, yeah. and I think they yeah. came from Judge Grierson, but uh, but in one instance, legal aid was opposed, I believe, and the other, um, I think uh, John Campbell, and I think we might have heard some of that testimony a few weeks ago. So, so I think that's yeah. the way things are going to continue. Okay, great, thank you. But, yeah, sure. And um, in that same vein, as you were mentioning, uh, Representative Grad, a couple of weeks ago, or was it last week? I went through this language. I walked the committee through the, the two sections we're looking at right now. We've, the committee's already seen it once before. That was before it was passed by Senate Judiciary. And so um, again, same idea of ha having everyone understand what's, uh, what's in there at the moment, subject to any changes. But as it turns out, uh, there were no changes to the language between what I walked you through, I wanna say last Thursday or Friday, I think late last week. Um, between that language that you saw at that time and the language that Senate Judiciary voted out Tuesday morning, at least with respect to these two sections, there weren't any changes. So the language is identical. And it does the same, the same um, thing as I mentioned last time that uh, the bill that, I don't think you voted out yet. I think maybe you took a straw poll on 316, the other bill relating to witnessing of wills, remote witnessing of wills, you know, which required the physical presence of the witness and the notary and these two sections that you're looking at in, um, in 114 essentially do the same thing for powers of attorney and for uh, use of deeds to transfer property that 316 did for, did for wills. And it's a, the exact same, exact same concept. You, if you look at sections two and three, the existing language and that's the non underlying pieces for for section two of the bill, the powers of attorney that's lines three through five. That's existing law and for section three, which is the deeds that's lines well 20 through 21 on the bottom of page two and then the first three lines of page three. Uh, essentially what the existing law is the same same thing as it was for wills with respect to physical presence, you see that it requires that the. Uh, power of attorney uh, or the deed both be executed in the physical presence of a notary public and one other person. In the case of a power of attorney, it's a witness. In the case of the deed, the other person is the grantor, the person who's, sell who's transferring the property. But in both cases, you have a requirement of physical presence of uh, the person executing the document, the notary public, and a third party, either a witness or the grantor. So the, the proposed uh, new language does the exact same thing that that and in fact the the language itself is very similar not verbatim but fairly close to the language you had seen for wills and it just essentially provides that as long as the um, the process is done in compliance with these emergency rules for remote notarial acts that have been uh, that have been um, uh, issued by the Secretary of State's office which means that it's done remotely through a secure audio video audio video connection as long as those rules are complied with then uh, the physical presence requirement will be deemed to have met so it will be deemed that in the case of the power of attorney the witness is there physically present with the notary public and the and the uh, principal ex executing the document and with respect to deeds the um, the notary public the grantor uh, show and and the uh, uh, the person executing the document are all going to be deemed to be physically present in the same location, even if, you know, technically they're not. Um, but uh, for purposes of the statute, they're deemed to be present. And that way it um, addresses the problem that had come up of people now with the stay at home order not being able to travel to be physically present with these other parties for purposes of uh, signing these documents so they can do them remotely. The way we're doing it right now, Zoom would be one option or whatever whatever remote secure connection they um, can establish for the purpose, but that would be permitted. And you'll see that that each of the, the sections, the um, section two on power of attorney and section of three on deeds in, includes almost identical uh, language in subdivision two of each section that provides that if these uh, procedures are complied with, if the remote notarial acts uh, pieces of the Secretary of State's rules, if these documents are executed 
in compliance with these uh, requirements, then there's a presumption that they're valid. So going forward, if there's ever a, uh, something that comes up where one of the documents validity is challenged in court, there's this presumption that attaches that the documents were validly executed. And that, again, a presumption can always be overcome. If there's some strong evidence that there was some fraud or some undue influence, that there were actual uh, pieces of evidence that, that tended to show that, then you could overcome the presumption. But there at least is some confidence for the parties who are putting these documents together that they're going to stand up in court later on because there's this presumption of validity that attaches. Excuse me, Eric. Uh, let's see, Barbara and then Will. Eric, thank, hi, good morning. Good morning. I, I cannot remember if we discussed this. I just was looking at my notes. Will this be, I know it's uh, would be valid upon passage, but would it be retro to the beginning of the emergency order? Yes, so that it would, it, as long as the, because the way the language is written, it's uh, as long as they're um, executed in compliance with the orders while they are in effect. So that would be, my, my reading would take it back to, I think it was last Tuesday was when uh, they were actually issued. But yes, they would, they would uh, uh, be, they would look back to the date that the, that the rules were adopted. That's great, thank you. Sure. Sorry, Will and then Martin. Thank you. Uh, my question is, it's a, it's a bit wider net, but uh, maybe uh, I'm hoping the committee answer. And it's in regards to deeds, um, you know, the, in the land records. So, I mean, I understand we can, uh, this would allow people to, to finish up things electronically, but is there anything in the works that, that you or anyone else that's listening in is aware of as far as um, viewing land records? Because I've heard from my city clerk and he's been told that he can't have people in his office to view uh, land records, which in a lot of transactions is the, the start of the process or at least early on in the process. And it's holding up sales in, in my community and really throwing things off. So I'm just wondering, it's great to have this taken care of at the bottom end. If, if anyone knows of anything that's going on to actually let the process carry out as far as the due diligence that needs to be done with existing records. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I have not heard of anything that's in the works regarding permission or or in some way setting up a process for people to view what's in the land records currently. It doesn't mean that some of the folks, for example, the real estate section of the Bar Association, that they might also be thinking about that issue. But but you're right that that isn't addressed here. And, and I haven't I haven't specifically heard about that. Might be a good question for, for Terry or someone from the uh, VBA real estate section is to see what, what their thoughts are on that. That's a good point. Right. All right, and thank I, you. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mike, thank you, informed us that Terry is watching. I don't know if she has the ability to, to speak, but, but Terry, I'm glad that you are, that you are listening and it would be helpful to, uh, to get an update on, on this information. Uh, okay, Martin. Yeah, I'm just, uh, want to revisit the issue that I brought up, uh, last week <clears throat> and it's, I don't, I'm not pushing for us to add that language in the subsections two to the will language, but I just want to ask you, Eric, if if uh, if there's a concern if we have that language here for the power of attorney and deeds, and we don't have the language for the wills, uh, can that be interpreted that you know the legislature knows what it's doing and we did not intend? to have that presumption for the wills because uh, we did put it in for the power of attorney and deeds and left it out of the wills. I mean, does that somehow raise a concern that that presumption would not exist for the wills because the legislature apparently knows how to make clear that there should be a presumption since it's doing so in these other two examples? Yeah, I think that's right that uh, um, and even even um, even hypothetically, if if there were no uh, power of attorney or deed sections, if they didn't exist, and you still had the, had the wills piece that didn't have a presumption, and 
there's, there wouldn't even be one in that case because the legislature would have to expressly put it out there to say that uh, there is a presumption. I guess what I'm saying is that I agree with your interpretation, but I think that the same result would apply. Your interpretation would be correct that even without the power of attorney and the deed pieces, there still wouldn't be a presumption in the in the wills context unless the legislature expressly put it out there. Um, but okay. So whether that's a problem or not, I mean, I think that's that's a separate question. I mean, you know, because the the um, the uh, wills language passed uh, the Senate as it was without the presumption. I think people hadn't hadn't thought of it yet, but um, I'll let them, you know, offer any perspective they may have on that. But I don't think it's a, a legal problem in the sense that it doesn't mean that the will wouldn't still be found valid. Uh, it just means that the presumption wouldn't attach. And But I agree with that. That would be the result. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And I should mention also that uh, I did uh, 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 mention the possibility of I think Representative Lalonde, you were the one who had brought up that one possible angle was to uh, potentially amend uh, 114 while it was still in the Senate to add that kind of language to to the new uh, provision on wills. But I think the thought was that that um, uh, they wanted everything to be as clean as and smooth as possible, and there was right. no way to be absolutely certain. Sort of, you know, we had sort of explored this idea of possibly, you know, if if 316 were to pass first and be signed by the governor first, would would then you be able to sort of amend it in this bill in 114? But no one's really sure exactly the timing of these things. When is that going to happen? Um, it was hard to hard to be certain of that, and it just seemed like it was at the time viewed as um, potentially slowing things down. Right. Understood. But as far as the uh, language goes, I mean, that's that's about it. The, uh, as I say, it um, does almost the identical thing for deeds and powers of attorney as the as 316 did for wills. Um, Posture-wise, it's past Senate Judiciary and may be coming out of the Senate on Friday. Not sure about that yet. And, and I think um, um, substantively, that's pretty much what I have. I sent an invite to Terry, so she may be dropped jumping in in a minute. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Eric. I'm not seeing any hands, but I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody in terms of questions for Eric. Oh, all right. Looks like everybody's good. Okay, well, thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, sure. Anytime. Yeah, yeah you bet. Take care. You too. Okay, great. Okay, great. So, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you to to help us with document share. All and, right. And welcome, Bryn. I see you. And then, if we do see Terry, if we have a few minutes, we can ask her to weigh in on uh, those other questions. Okay. okay. Thank this you, isn't going to take but a couple minutes to do. Okay. Um, you can probably all see on the bottom of your screen. You've got a share screen button. It's green with an up arrow. The best thing to do is to, Terry's coming in right now, um, get whatever you want to show up on your screen before you press that button. So now I'm going to go to share screen. Mike, is that the share content button? Yes. Okay, on, on an iPad, it's on the top, but. Okay. So on my computer, it's giving me a bunch of options here. I'm gonna share the bill though. So this is the one we're talking about. My suggestion would be, if you have several things you wanna show, to try to get them all in a PDF document so you can just page from one to the next one rather than going back and forth. That's just a suggestion on my part, but you can do whatever you think, but. So I assume everybody can see this. Yeah, no, I'm saying that I'm just seeing the desktop one, other things, I'm not seeing an actual document. 
On me? You can't see the document? I see uh, it. I see it. All right, let me, yeah. Yeah, I see it as well. Okay, now, now I, I do. do, now I do. Okay, got it. Thank you. <clears throat> so that's really all there is to it is identify what you want, have it on your desktop open before you share the screen and then just hit the share screen. Can I ask a question about a feature, Mike? Um, sure. Or maybe I'll just try to model it. I think there, oh, no, you just the screen sharing is disabled. I think there's a whiteboard feature in the share screen um, functions. We don't have to answer this right now, but like if we ever wanted to do that collective note taking, I think there's a way to do that right in the Zoom platform, but I haven't really had a chance to got to find some, uh, maybe some Zoom environment where I can actually play around with it, but. Yes, there is, Selena. Uh, we've, we've used it at uh, School Board. Okay, okay, great. So that's another, I guess that's another feature we could um, draw on if we need it. And how about scrolling through the pages through the document? Uh, so, so Mike, the host, you would need to do that. So we can't do that individually. You could do it yourself. Huh, okay. Oh, I have to do it because that's sharing my screen. Okay. So that's really all there is to it. So, so whoever puts a document up will, uh, it'll, they'll kind of. Uh, um, run run it the same way a witness would from uh, the witness chair and having the iPad then. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. And Bryn is actually going to walk us through the non-probate section. So might be a, a good time to, to try it. Any other questions about this? I think I'm going to be good. I'm going to be sticking with paper. <laughs> No, my, my limits. Oh boy. Uh, okay. Oh, there's Terry. Great. Welcome, Terry. I don't know if Terry can. I just lost Terry. Huh. I got oh, out of the stop share because okay. I wanted to see if Terry was muted. She's she's not muted, so she should be able to talk. Okay. Great. There she is. Great. Welcome, Terry. Good morning. Or uh, yep, still morning. So um, hi. Thank you for thank you for joining. I'm not sure if you had a did you did you have an opportunity to um, to hear the question about uh, viewing documents and uh, can you can you hear me? I think Terry needs to turn on. I think you need to turn on your audio uh, feed, uh, Terry. Okay, we can't hear you. You don't have a little microphone yet. Still can't hear you, Terry. Do you have to do that, uh, Mike, uh, or is that something that's local with Terry? Everything from my end says she's okay. It's on her end that she needs to. I just sent her a quick text that we can't hear, hear her. So, um, yeah, she probably, oh, she probably can't hear that. Oh, no, <laughs> there I know. There, there you are. There oh. you are. <laughs> I, I clicked it, but great. Hi. I did hear the question about land records, and it is a, a serious issue because. Oh. Oh. Okay. I, I have my. Terry, are you are you watching it on YouTube still? Yeah, it sounds like one has the YouTube feed going because it's a few minutes behind. There, 
Yes. Unfortunately, there's a delay. Okay. So, how about if we um, if we move on to um, hear from and then Terry? Um, my quick understanding is that you do acknowledge the problem and know it's an issue, and uh, and hopefully we can hear back from you. Um, and uh, yes. if there's anything that we need to to do legislatively. Or email. Perfect. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Bryn. Hi. Welcome. Frank, uh, can you uh, mute Terry, please? I'll just I'll just wait for a moment until that comes back to the computers. Okay. Okay. All Great. right. Good morning, committee. Um, good morning. Nice to see you. Yeah. Oh, nice, to, nice to see you all. Um, yeah. Thank you. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm here to talk about um, Senate Bill number 114. I believe that the draft number is 3.2 that's been posted to your webpage. I'm hoping everybody has that. I am not going to do screen sharing today. Um, I have a I have requested um, some help from IT, but so far I just haven't been able to get my Outlook to close while um, I'm sharing my screen. So sometimes I have emails that pop up, and so um, I'm just I'm not going to do that today. If it's okay with everybody, if you have it on your own screen to go through, if that's all right. Okay, good. So I know that Eric um, was here to walk you through those sections two and three. So I'm not going to talk about those. So I'll just start with section one. <clears throat> and this is the section that deals with the rent escrow hearings. So as um, I think that you've all heard from Judge Grierson about um, administrative order number 49 that um, stays all non-emergent hearings with some exceptions. Um, so I just wanna start there that AO 49 does allow for emergency landlord tenant hearings um, in the discretion of the judge that's overseeing those proceedings. Um, so what this section does is it provides that if a, if a court did exercise its discretion to hold a hearing pursuant to 12 VSA 4853, which is those rent escrow hearings during the state of emergency, what this section does is it would give the judge discretion about whether or not to require um, a tenant to pay rent into court as it accrues because cur under current law, under that section 12 VSA 4853A, the courts are required to order that payment of back rent as it accrues during the course of the proceeding. So the, the, this, all this section does is say, it says that during the course of the emergency period, which as you can see is defined there as the period beginning with the state of emergency declaration on March 13th, um, until 30 days after the governor terminates that state of emergency by declaration. During that emergency period, um, the judges have discretion about whether or not to require tenants to pay rent into court. That's all this does. So, so Bryn is, um, so currently it's, it would say shall, are they? That's, that's the only difference. So current law, that, that language there is taken directly from that section, um, that section in, in Title 12. And currently it says the court shall order full or partial payment into court of rent on line 15 of page one. Okay, thank you. And this language again came from Judge Grierson, is that correct? Yes, I'm sorry, I should have started yeah. um, with this that the judiciary did make um, some requests of the legislature to carry out um, the intent of AO 49, which is essentially to stay for some proceedings and to suspend some statutory timeframes. And so every, um, all, of the, all of the sections in this bill come from that request from the judiciary. Okay, thank you. And if, if you, I don't know if you can answer this and it could wait if this is not the right time, but I know that Senate Economic Development uh, looked at some of these sections and then also uh, House General also has a bill, and uh, at some point, I'd like to understand the uh, the differences or similarities between between all those bills regarding uh, regarding rent and housing. Okay. 
<clears throat> okay. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk about that. We can also um, bring David Hall is the one who's working on those bills. He might be the okay. best person to talk about the nuances. Great. I can tell you sort of generally what they do, um, if what how they interact right now, if you'd like. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so what this what the and m my understanding is that the um, House General Committee has been sharing its language with the Senate Economic Development Committee. So I believe that that section nine in the House bill is the same as what appears in the Senate bill. <clears throat> and essentially what that bill is doing is it's staying all eviction proceedings until the end of the emergency. And it does talk about rent escrow in that in section nine of the House bill. And essentially what it does is it limits the amount of back rent, rent that can be required by the court um, until the end of the emergency period or after. So um, that is that interacts with this to the extent that there's a time frame for which um, a court can order back rent be paid, and there's no time frame in this bill. This bill just says, um, judges, you have discretion about whether or not to require them to pay back rent at all. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, what version of the House bill is, are they at at this point? Um, I have one. I have a draft, and I'm just wondering if I'm looking at the. You know, draft. I don't. I I am sorry. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what they're looking at currently, but I can find out from David and and email the committee if that's helpful. All right, thanks. Okay, <clears throat> so that's really the that's it for section one. Unless there are other questions, I can move on to section four. I'll just skip those those two sections that you just talked about with Eric, the powers of attorney, and the deeds section. So section four is at the bottom of page three, <clears throat> and this amends rule 43. Um, and rule 43 permits, a um, well, the existing rule 43 requires the presence of the defendant at cer certain stages of a proceeding. Um, so what this does is it amends that, uh, that rule by adding a new subsection D, which you can see on the top of page four. So we're in um, the rules of criminal procedure right now. So we're talking about a defendant's presence at certain stages of a criminal proceeding. So what this new subsection does is it says that if certain criteria are met, um, the defendant is deemed to be present at the proceeding, even if their physical presence is not actually there. So the criteria are set out in subdivisions A and B there. So under A, if the defendant, after he or she has an opportunity to consult with their counsel, either um, in person or by telephone or by um, video conference. And then the defendant makes a, right, a waiver on the record of their right to be physically present at the proceeding. And B, their appearance at the proceeding is made by contemporaneous video or audio conference transmission. Then the, then the defendant is deemed to have been to be present in court pursuant to this rule. And then subdivision two there just defines um, contemporaneous audio or video conference the way it's defined in um, the RCP 43.1, which defines those as an interactive audio or video technology that permits two or more individuals or groups to communicate contemporaneously. And then it also pro provides some technical criteria for that technology. Does that make sense? Looking for uh, hands, uh, Barbara. Uh, thanks. So Bryn, here, let me just try to find you. Um, so I'm wondering, because I know this came up when we were looking at video conferencing from prison, that there was some issue about privacy in the conversation between counsel and um, the defendant. Is that built into part of the ability to consult with attorney in a confidential manner? Not there, nothing about that appears here um, in, in this version of the bill, no. Um, but, and that was not, that was not something that was discussed on the Senate side either. Thank you. I do remember that coming up before um, in some justice oversight meetings. I'm not sure if that's been addressed in some way or not. And we, I feel, right, I feel like the public defenders raised it at some point. 
trying to yeah. remember if anyone else did. But right, was- and yeah, and we we will be hearing from them, but my understanding is that, that they did agree with this language here. Is that correct, Bryn? That is correct, yes. Yeah. The Defender General supported this language, um, yes. Okay, and again, we'll be hearing from them. Okay, so I see uh, Will and then Selena. Thank you. So um, in regards to uh, um, A, the, the defendant makes an on the record waiver of the right to be physically present. What would an on the record waiver look like? A signed document, some video recording? Um, it would be a, it, my understanding is that typically it's just a verbal agreement or a verbal waiver of that right. Um, the judge would make a statement. Do you understand this is your right pursuant to rule 43? And the defendant would say, yes, I understand that it's my right. And then the judge would confirm that the person has had an opportunity to consult with their counsel. And the defendant would have to acknowledge that they did have that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Selena and then Coach. Sorry, I'm trying to do so many things simultaneously. Uh, So... I was going to note just in response to what Barbara said that what I had asked a little bit about the um, just video use of video generally the last time we heard from Marshall and he he did indicate that they're good and understanding with how things are moving forward so it'll be good to hear more from him but I, he did give some indication that like they were okay with where things were heading to our committee as well. And um, I'm just wondering, I've, I've struggled to find these before in the past. I'm just wondering for those of us who might wanna dig a little more deeply into the rules of criminal um, procedure, like how do we find those to just look at the definition around the audio video conferencing that's been, is that an, is that an like newly created definition for these circumstances or was that pre-existing and no that was pre-existing although rule 43.1 was recently adopted and i'm okay. share with share that with the committee um i can send you the link to that rule so you can read it are they readily like are they readily accessible online or how do you, you can uh, you can google it you can google it i'm looking at it right now and it's pretty easy to find i think that through the website through your website you um the vermont legislature legislative website that there's a link to the Lexis Nexus um okay it's through Lexis Nexus okay uh court rules mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay thank you uh coach right and then Martin uh yes just a, a process piece madam chair um what is going to, to be our capability to um amend uh, the the Senate version, um, you know, just from a procedural perspective. So uh, my understanding at this point is that uh, that hoping that we would not be amending uh, Senate Senate versions, and certainly we can when we hear from the witnesses, we can ask them. You know, we can see if they if they bring up any any suggested amendments, but uh, that's my understanding at this time. But it, I think you can already understand why I posed the question. Uh, if if we get a very clear uh, or identify a very clear uh, exception that was missed mm-hmm. and, and it's, I, I mean, it happens to us when our bills go to their side and it, Right. When theirs come to our side, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how that's going to work because I, I, I would have a little bit of a problem knowing that there's something wrong and not being able to address it. Right. Right. And, and that's not being a jerk about it. It's just um, right. No, it's just doing doing our work for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, just a couple of things just in response as well to coach is, I mean, that's what we did with this wills issue that we talked about a little bit earlier. We raised the issue of whether they should amend this bill to include the language regarding the presumption. 
and that message did get delivered to them and and for good reasons they decided not to do so and, and i would suspect if we find some issues we can send them back channel again to the senate and hopefully have them resolved before it ever comes to us that would be what i would think but i also just want to address barbara really quickly is that the <clears throat> the uh, Vermont Rules of Criminal Procedure 43.1 that is referenced uh, does have language about uh, whether there's satisfactory provision for confidential communications between the lawyers and their clients or witnesses. I mean, it's in that rule that 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 kind of concern is is covered. So you may want to take a look at that. Great. Any? Uh, no, I I, I guess the the other thing, just like uh, everything else we're doing with the electronic voting and things of that sort, uh, it's it's getting used to the technology. And I think that uh, what people will find is as they get more familiar and their IT divisions uh, help them, you know, through that, uh, because I think the court uh, is where you're going to see that evolve very quickly. Uh, because we've been doing executive sessions at our last two meetings, and we were able to move into executive session, do it privately, and then come back out and take the vote. So uh, it does exist. You know, it's just a matter of everybody just getting there, I guess. Right. And my understanding from the, the speaker, and I think she talked about it in her memo, that um, that right now all the committees um, will have been trained I think by the end of the week and then from committees um, they'll be doing larger groups into it to eventually somehow accommodate uh, 100 you know 49 of us or whatever and that, that that's what's going to take the time is uh, my understanding from from the speaker so but you know that was more directed to Barbara's question about um, the uh, uh, confidentiality component okay. Okay. Uh, because that's that's what we had to deal with we had uh, a couple of contract issues mm -hmm. that we had to bring up um, and so we went into executive session and that electronically shut down the live feeds and mm -hmm. uh, then we came back out and okay voted, so could visit that with a with the judge okay great great thank you so Bryn back to you all right, so I'll move on to section five then. Um, and section five for those tracking is on the bottom of page four. <clears throat> so what this section does is it suspends um, or extends statutory timeframes for certain proceedings until AO49 is terminated. So there's just some introductory language there at the bottom of the page um, about AO49. And the intent of the legislature is to temporarily suspend some timeframes um, by which certain proceedings are required to take place by statute. So if you turn to the next page, um, sub, subsection one um, extends the statutory timeframes for bail review hearings. So um, subsection A there applies for conditions of release review pursu pursuant to 7554 D1. And the existing timeframe for these hearings is 48 hours. So these are bail review hearings for people who are detained um, because they couldn't abide by the conditions of uh, release that were set for them or people who are released on an order to return to custody um, or also these are hearings uh, that the state can request based on like a material change in circumstances. So the statutory time frame for these um, conditions of, re of release review hearings are 48 hours. And what this does is extends those um, to seven days following application. So it moves from 48 hours to seven days. Bryn, um, do you know where that language from 48 to seven days came from, that, that time frame? Seven days, this was what the um, judiciary requested. It was directly from that memo from the judiciary, which if you don't have, I can make sure that um, Mike has it to post. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Thanks, Maxine. Um, so, Brent, seven business days or seven calendar days? Seven calendar days. It has to say working days if it um, applies only to business days <clears throat> after a day for a day. Right, right. Um, can you um, just 
talk about what the implication is of that for um, people? Are they then being held um, in detention pending this hearing? They've been picked up and they're been re um, detained or they're in the community. I just want to make sure I understand who who besides the judges and the lawyers does, you know, what's the impact on the defendant and the public? Right. So I, it depends on the circumstances. If there are people who have violated their conditions of release, um, there, there are in situations where they would have been picked up and they may be detained until this hearing can be held. Um, there also may be situations where they're not detained where, for example, the state requests the hearing because of a material change in circumstances, those people may not be detained. So I think it depends on the circumstances. So it could mean that instead of somebody being held pending the detent the hearing um, for 48 hours, they could be there a week if they were one of the people that got re-detained. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I think I, I'm not sure I understood that question. Maybe could you repeat it? Sure. So I guess, again, I'm trying to figure out what the range is of who loses their uh, freedom for seven days and possible exposure, you know, increased exposure to COVID-19. So you said it depends on the circumstances, but some people's circumstances will mean that they are in detention for seven days instead of 48. That is possible, yes. or that they're out in the community for seven days in some, I mean, what maybe one of the conditions is don't be near a child and they're living in a house with a child in the meantime. Again, I think if there's an understanding that they're violating their conditions that in, and it may be helpful to talk to the practitioners in this area, but my understanding is that if there's knowledge that they are violating those conditions, they could be detained. Those are the kind of situations where they would be detained by law enforcement. So we are gonna hear from, um, from prosecutors and defense uh, later on about these sections. So, so do note your questions in that way. Um, cause, cause again, this is agreed to language. So let's make sure that, um, that they address those in coming to this agreement and, and uh, we can get the answers that, that we need. So it'd be great. Okay. 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 Anybody else's? No? Okay. All right. Go ahead. Thank you, Bryn. So I'll move on to subdivision B there. Um, and this applies for conditions of release review pursuant to 7554 D2. Um, the existing time frame for these hearings is within five working days and that has been extended to 14 days following application. So these are all other bail review hearings for people for whom conditions are of release are imposed. Um, so it extends that time frame from five working days to 14, 14 days following application. So the next, oh, I'll wait for a minute. I'll move on to the set number two here. That's okay. Um, so what this section does is it provides that um, all statutory timeframes um, for issuing orders to seal or expunge criminal history records or to process um, seal, sealing or expungement petitions are suspended for the duration of the effectiveness of AO49. And that um, suspension extends for 120 days after AO49 is terminated. So all of those, all um, relevant statutory timeframes pursuant to the expungement and sealing chapter are suspended for the duration of the emergency and then 120 days beyond. And again, this came from a request from the judiciary. Um, just, I, and I believe that the uh, intent here is to preserve um, the capacity that they have um, with their limited staff at the time. Barbara. Okay, I'm only going to ask for clarification because taking your last point in mind, Maxine. So, so basically, somebody who was about to have their record expunged if life had continued normally um, 
now would have to wait until the end of the emergency order and up to 120 days after that ends. So all the people that are unemployed right now that might be applying for jobs might get caught. I mean, again, that's not, I understand Bryn, I should ask the practitioners about that, but I'm just thinking that's a long range of time for people. Yeah, I don't, nothing about it prevents anybody from filing those petitions. Um, it just provides that the court doesn't have to abide by those timeframes for responding to the petitions or issuing orders based on those petitions. Selena. So, so, okay, so I'm just trying to understand this then. So someone who filed for the executive order ends, someone filed 120 days, you know, essentially four months later, they would be held to the then the then the judiciary would be held to the statutory time the current statutory time frames for processing um, the sealing or expungement request. Are they held to no time frame whatsoever for any requests that come in during the executive order and during those um, then subsequent four months? Like how does that work? They could they say like we're not going to get to that one for five years because it came in. Do you know what I mean? Is there any kind of parameter on when they have to respond to the requests that do come in when the time frames are suspended? That come in during the state of emergency? Or the 120 days after. Right. So I think one that would come in at the end of that 120 days, the statutory time frames would then apply to those. So if a person waited to petition until the end of 120 days after the state of emergency, the regular statutory time frame would apply to those. But petitions that are um, pending or petitions that are filed during the state of emergency, um, the statutory time frame would not apply. So my understanding is that picking up anything that came in during the state of emergency 120 days after would pick up and the statutory time frame would apply. So it would be as if the person didn't apply until the 120 days following like the state of emergency. The clock would start, at yeah. the, but it's not like those could be in some kind of permanent. No. Um, no. Okay, Martin. Actually, I think I, 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 I I'm withdrawing my question. I, I think that was answered uh, just now. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kenny, do you? Kenny. Yeah. So, do we need to uh, specify that 120 days, or, or could it be? Different, so um, you know, maybe maybe things will get back to normal quicker. I think the idea is that the court has the authority to um, extend AO forty nine for as long as it needs to. So right now, AO forty nine is um, scheduled to expire or be terminated on April fifteenth, but the court has the authority to extend that um, by order. So. Um, 120 days following the termination of AO 49 could be at any any point in the future based on how far the court extends um, the duration of AO 49. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thanks. I, I think what they're trying to get at was to put people back to work quicker, right, with the expungement. Right, that was one of the major policy goals of the, of the expansion of availability of expungement and sealing, yes. Um, and I think, again, you know, Judge Gerson is the best to address this, but my understanding is that these are sort of low on the priority for the court um, because so many things are piling up during the duration of the state of emergency that they're sort of trying to prioritize what needs to be done by the court first when the state of emergency ends. And yeah. I think the idea of adding that 120 days. Um, is the court's way of saying <clears throat> these are sort of on the back burner for this duration of time while we build back up um, our capacity and deal with all of the things that we need to deal with. I understand. Thank you. Is it okay if I move on to subsection three here? The last one in section five. Thank you. Yes. 
Okay. So um, this is the last suspension of statutory timeframes um, under section five. And what this does is it suspends just for the duration of AO 49, no extension beyond it, just for the duration, the statutory timeframes for preliminary and merits hearings on um, civil driver's license, license suspensions. Um, so this applies, um, the preliminary, so under current statute, the preliminary hearing um, is scheduled to be held, has to be held within 21 days of the alleged offense. And the merit hearing has to be held within 21 days from the preliminary hearing. So that's often referred to as the 42 day rule. Um, and under current law, those driver's license suspensions are effective 11 days after notice, which is prior to those hearings. So the second thing this section does is it says first, these statutory timeframes, those 21 days um, or the 42 day rule is suspended. And also it prohibits the superior court from suspending or disqualifying a person's driver's license um, just during the state of emergency until that civil suspension hearing on the merits is held. So, if, um, so typically a person would have their driver's license suspended under these circumstances. And I can talk about the circumstances if you want. Um, prior to that hearing being held, but this says we're, we're suspending the timeframes and while we're suspending the timeframes, um, you can't have your driver's license suspended until you've had that merits hearing. So what type of offenses, Bryn, um, do these apply to? And when you say civil offenses. Right, right. so this is, we're talking about like um, a criminal refusal. Um, so that is when you've had a previous conviction for driving under the influence um, and you are pulled over and um, a law enforcement officer who has reason to believe you're in violation of the DUI statute um, requests an evidentiary test and you refuse that test. That's a criminal refusal situation. Um, that's, a, that's an automatic six month civil suspension under existing law. Um, also, if you are, if you have a evidentiary test result that shows that your blood alcohol content is high, it's at um, 0.16 or higher, which is double the legal limit. Um, or if you have a second or subsequent conviction, and then you're found to be operating um, by an evidentiary test with 0.02 blood alcohol content or higher. So those are the situations where um, these hearings would apply. So that, so that makes sense. All the, so those timeframes for those hearings are suspended and also it prohibits the Supreme Court from suspending your driver's license until you've had the hearing on the merits. Okay. Martin. So, well, I suppose we'll probably hear this from uh, the witnesses as far as the rationale for that one. So uh, I won't ask that question, but a second question is, um, what about other, I'm sure there are many other statutory deadlines that that exist for courts. Um, has has the court considered all of those, and these are the only ones, or should there be some sort of a blanket uh, suspension of certain categories? Um, there were some. You may have heard that there were some other requests by the court for statutory time frame suspension um, that did get removed from the initial version of the bill. Um, but, you know, that would be a good question for Judge Grierson. My understanding is that these were the, these were their priorities that they needed suspensions for. Okay. And again, you know, what I would say about that is that they, that, and I imagine what Judge Grierson may say to you is that meeting those, that 42 day rule um, for those types of hearings is, is, is going to be a challenge for them. And that's why they requested this particular statute to be um, the time frame to be suspended. All right, thanks. Oh. oh, that's great. I see that Mike just um, posted the original memo, which should be helpful. Um, so I'll move on to section six, unless there are other questions. So this section <clears throat> suspends the um, statutes of limitations or statutes of repose for beginning a civil action. Um, that would otherwise expire during the duration of the state of emergency. Um, so all of those civil action statute of limitations are told until 60 days after the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration. 
So what that word told means is essentially that um, you just add that amount of time to the statute of limitations. So if the statute of limitations would have otherwise run out on April 1st, the duration of the, um, the state of emergency would be added from April 1st onward. So it just is sort of a pause on those statute of limitations during the duration of the emergency. Okay. Question. I saw some questions. I, I had a question and I, I answered it for myself. And right, <laughs> raising my hand, so I withdraw it. Okay. Okay, so if I don't see any other ones, I'll move on to the last section, section seven. Yeah. Um, so this uh, was. Martin, sorry. Yeah, just uh, I, I just took, took a quick look at, uh, at, at the memo from Judge Grierson. And he does ask for the suspension of those hearings, but doesn't suggest, at least in this memo, uh, that the suspension should not occur until that yes. the driver's license suspension shouldn't occur until after uh, the emergency order is complete or I mean, that seems to have been added. Do you know who Here. suggested that uh, addition that the driver's license shouldn't be suspended during this term, even though under normal circumstances it would be suspended? Yes, um, thank you for pointing that out. That was not a part of the original request. That came up in testimony. The Defender General requested that um, those driver's license suspensions not occur if there, if there was gonna be some perhaps months long wait for a person to um, have their hearing held on their civil suspension. So those, um, that would be a sort of an unintended consequence that people would not have their driver's license for perhaps months while they're waiting for their hearing to be held. Huh. So, I mean, th this isn't for you, but <laughs> this is, I guess, the rest of the committee. That, that, that part troubles me. Somebody who is uh, double the legal limit uh, is getting a free pass for some number of months. Um, and I don't know if this, I mean, again, we don't want to be in a situation where we want to do a, uh, an amendment uh, that comes over, but I, <clears throat> that so far, that's the one thing that has troubled me of all these things that we've, we've been seeing is, is somebody who is, especially a, their second DUI and they're, they're driving at a certain limit, uh, that is very troublesome to me. That's not for you, Bryn. That's <laughs> I, no, 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 I, I understand. And uh, again, I think what, what might be helpful is um, folks who have these questions, if uh, maybe even send it ahead of time to, uh, to the witnesses uh, so they, they know that, you know, we want to make sure that they, um, that they can address them. And I, um, again, our time is limited with our witnesses and certainly we'll need to um, come back, but I've been hearing um, through the speaker that the more folks can get a heads up about concerns, uh, the easier it is for them to, uh, to address them. Um, so, so should I do that? Should I go ahead and send that to sure. uh, yeah. Grierson and Marshall and yeah, I would think the Pepper. group, you know, the witnesses that we're hearing from this afternoon. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, so I'll move on to the last section. Great. Um, and this section is also, you won't see this one in the original memo from the judiciary. They requested this um, on the last day of testimony. So this kind of was a late um, coming request. So what this section does is it allows for alternative filing requirements when notarizations are required for certain filings. Um, and it allows for those alternative re filing requirements just during the state of emergency. So obviously right now, due to the inability to obtain notary signatures during the pandemic, um, there is a need that has arisen for, the, for an alternative manner of filing. So what this does is it allows parties to file documents that would otherwise require notarization um, by filing the document with just the specific language that um, it has to be inserted above the signature line, which you see there. Um, and it applies to any court filings except for 
affidavits in support of a search warrant application or applications for a non-testimonial -testi identification order. So you see that language um, appears, let's see, in lines 13 through 16, just a declaration that the, that the statement is true and accurate and an understanding that if the statement is false, the person would be subject to the penalty of perjury or other sanctions. And then- Martin, yeah. So uh, could you explain what a non-testimonial identification order is? Yes. Hold on one second. To get blood or take blood or something like that, I think, Bryn? So that means identification by fingerprints um, or other like reasonable physical examination, like a handwriting sample or a voice sample or a photo for a lineup or something similar. Okay. Uh, Selena? Yeah. I had the exact same question, so thanks. Okay. Um, so the last section just makes the act effective on passage and then uh, retitles the bill to an act relating to the emergency judicial response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And that's it. Thank you. Um, so it, it doesn't look like DMV testified. Would nope. they have, okay. And I'm not, would they, would they generally testify or is this really more defense and prosecution and, and judiciary? I'm not sure that they, um, unless they wanted to weigh in on the policy aspect, I'm not sure that they're implicated in any other way because it's the superior court that actually does those license suspensions. Um, so unless they were gonna weigh in on the policy, I'm not sure that they would be affected otherwise. Okay, thank you. Any other? Okay, thank you. Uh... Feels like a lot to digest. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else is feeling that way. Uh, and maybe that's why we're having the questions that we're having. Um, hmm. I did see your witness list. It looks like you have, um, you're hearing from everybody that the Senate heard from as well as some additional people, um, if that's helpful. So you should be able to get everyone's perspectives. Okay. All right. All right, thank you, Bryn. So we do have a little bit of time left over. We can, um, and again, I'm just thinking out loud here. One thing we can do is we could review the questions that people have concerns about. Um, would that be helpful to make sure that we as a, as a committee understand them versus each committee member reaching out to specific witnesses? Uh, uh, and I've started an discussion. email. I've started an email right now, so I'm happy to make to this our on. make this the judicial or the, all of our email. I mean, all of our concerns in okay. one. I I think that would be helpful. Is others other thoughts? Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Martin. So I think it'd be good to go, you know, section by section, and then um, and that way. So, for instance, you know, Barbara, you could speak to your particular concerns in your sections. Uh, so. Go ahead. Just gonna have my glasses. All right. Maxine. Yeah. Can I just ask a process question? I'm sorry to. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you want us to go like section one and then everybody highlight their questions and then section two and everybody? Okay. That, that's my thinking, but I'm also open to if there's a, uh, another way to do it. Tom has a, his hand up. And if you had thoughts about it. Uh, not the procedure, just uh, uh, some questions that I have around section one. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I, I'm, Maybe I don't understand the section, um, but I'm just kind of wondering if somehow with this section, can landlords uh, be um, 
Well, in, in a sense, just come up short on their money because I, I, uh, I do have a friend that he owns one house, uh, you know, he, uh, with the way rents are and, and uh, not just renting to anybody. I mean, he's on, uh, uh, he's on the line basically as far as losing it goes. Now with something like this, what would happen uh, um, with somebody maybe not having to pay their rent or, or the, if, that type of thing? And uh, is there any protections for him, um, you know, uh, coming up short money with his mortgage payments? And, and I, does that apply to this section? I guess I would ask first. Brynn, are you able to respond to that or is that more for the witnesses? <clears throat> Um, I think that, so this applies just in this limited circumstance of the rent escrow hearing. So I'm, I don't think that this particular section addresses um, the, the other side, the, the side of having to pay the mortgage payments. Um, I'm not sure if that is addressed in the House General Bill and the Senate Economic Development Bill. It may be. Um, but I would, have to, I would have to connect with the Legislative Council there and get back to you. Right, right. I, I think it would be important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And it, it would be great to know what the status of, of the House General Bill is. And Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Is that a question uh, for the witnesses, you think, or is that for David? For uh, Legislative Council? Uh, Britt, does that sound like more like one for David, you think? as opposed to the witnesses? Is that how I understood you? Um, I think that, I mean, I think as a general matter, whether or not it appears in the bill, that, that's a question for us. Um, and again, I, I'm, I can connect with David to find out about that. Um, it may also be a question for the witnesses, depending on the answer to whether or not it appears in that bill. All right, we'll, I'll, I'll send it to the witnesses. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, anybody? Great, thank you, everyone. Yeah, anybody else on section one? Yep. Okay. Uh, section two or three. Those are the. Nope. Okay. I, I had the question in relation to uh, section three as far as not what's on the, the bill is proposed, but whether or not there's any work being done to allow access to uh, land records right. earlier in the process. Great, okay, thank you, yeah. And I, I have one, I think on section two or three, I'm not, um, but um, Glenn Jarrett, one of my constituents who is an attorney had, I had um, emailed Eric about Glenn's concern about um, the power of attorney for people from other states because in other states, often they use the standard of two um, witnesses. Um, and so Glenn was hoping, Eric was under the impression that this language would take care of it, mm -hmm. but Glenn was hoping that we could add language to put some belts and suspenders around that so that there isn't an issue with somebody, it involves somebody from out of state. And I have an email from him, which will explain it more clearly than I just did because I, quickly realized, wait, this is the section I need to have that language for. Right. Um, so that'd be a good question for Terry, I think. Yes. Okay. Maxine, could I jump in there for oh, a second? Yeah. yeah, there you are. Yep. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Representative Grad. Yeah. Um, Representative Rachelson, I just want to clarify, I, I didn't actually, and if I miscommunicated, I apologize. I did not intend to say uh, that the uh, power of attorney section takes care of the uh, advanced directives. I don't think it does. The, okay. what, I, what I said was that it took care of, you had a separate question that I said you asked about two things and I think it did take care of the other power attorneys, attorney Got issues. It, it did not, okay. it doesn't address advanced directives. The, the advanced directive statute requires that, it, that advanced directives be executed um, by the principal and two or more witnesses. It does not actually require notarization at all. Right. So, so it would not be covered by rules regarding uh, notarization. It, it's it's a separate requirement for for a, the person who executes the advance directive. You know, the person, the principal who's designating other people who can make healthcare decisions on their behalf, 
and it has to be witnessed by two or more witnesses. And I don't think that, um, I think that's a separate issue that uh, is not covered in any of the legislation you have in front of you right now. Okay, and it does sound like, um, and Terry can answer this, that it's bigger than just um, Glenn's practice that practitioners use a, notar a notary just in case the client is from out of state. Um, so that could be an issue that again, I don't know if we can tack onto this or not. Yeah, I think that's a, a policy decision for, for you folks to, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's a, I, I saw Glenn's email on that. I, I suppose that's true that, that if you, it's be an interesting question. I, it's probably not immediately apparent from the language. The statute requires two witnesses, doesn't say anything about notaries, but let's say you had two notaries be your witnesses, then they would, you know, they could, remotely notarized pursuant to the Secretary of State's rules. I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether uh, whether that might satisfy the statute. It, it might, but I'm not right. sure. Glenn, Glenn, Glenn also is willing to testify. I think he is um, trying to sit in on these hearings and might be on right now even. So I know we don't have time today, but I'm just wondering if Terry and or Glenn can. I think I think it'd be helpful to uh, make sure that Terry sees Glenn's email or understands his concerns and and uh, give us an update on whether or not they have addressed it or what their thinking is. So okay, great. So, Thank you. So this doesn't sound like a question for this afternoon's witnesses, though. Uh, no, no, it'd be for Terry. I think right. right. Okay. Uh, okay. Section four, criminal rule of procedure 43. And questions, concerns about that one? Nope. Okay, seeing any? Okay, uh, section five. I think this is where we had and more questions, right? Uh, Selena, sorry. That's okay. Um, so I think a lot of my questions are along the lines of um, some of the questions Barbara put forward here. So um, for the extending um, the time that detainees can be held obviously with everything where that's evolving particularly over the past week in our correctional facilities that is of concern so my question would really be because i think last week we heard a lot about all the work that different players in our court systems are doing to actually reduce the detainee population mm -hmm. and like questions are does that work adequately counterbalance this i think that's the way i would frame that question because you know, an additional week for someone, a week instead of a 48 hour period, those, those are like, we don't want people to be in a situation where that difference is a, le you know, a, a life or death sentence um, potentially for, um, for, for a crime that they haven't even been sentenced for. So I have th those questions. And then my other question um, really relates similarly to Representative Rachelson's to the implications of that then four month delay plus the period of the executive order on the um, sealing and expungement order isn't just like what are the imp and uh, you know I don't know if our witnesses are exactly the ones to answer this maybe maybe to public defenders can help with that and and um even the network and some others, but like, what are the implications of that on a time of such unprecedented employment, um, employment numbers for folks to then have this population be like really at a um, further disadvantage on the other side of 
things. So that's, or, or at a disadvantage in that they can't, you know, they don't have the same access to clearing records that they would have. Right, right, thank you. Yeah, Barbara, gonna add to that. Um, thank you, yes. Yeah, so again, it would be great to hear from a few people about the types of examples that this 48 hours to seven days um, effects. Again, I think I just sent um, a couple of you something that the Vera Institute was touting about another state that went the other direction in terms of bail and really gave the, um, the defendant the, the sort of the, it went in the other direction. Like let's not make a defendant's suffer, but let's assume that we can just lower bail for everybody in this time period um, and conditions. And I can try to find that article again. Um, the same thing with the expungement piece. I'm wondering not so much about people that are filing at the end, but we didn't talk about somebody that filed. Were they up to date when that executive order went into place? Or are there people that put in a petition for expungement sometime in February, you know, I don't know, how old are the ones that are in the queue right now? And now they're gonna also wait another 120 days. Um, this sure would be a great time to do automatic um, expungement as the uh, fallback rule during this period rather than extending a time period. Thank you. Others on this? Um, so do you want me to ask, should we be doing automatic <laughs> expungement? Because I know what the answer is on that, except there, it's not automatic right now. They can't do it automatically. It takes personnel going through files, but I'm happy to ask the question. That may, <laughs> that may bring up some controversial debate. <laughs> I, I bet we could get some legislators to volunteer to help. Hey, I'd do some paperwork from home to get those done. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to, to see if these things, issues were thought of and, and if they were, uh, what brought them, really would be the Defender General's office um, on board with this. So, I, um, yeah. And if they didn't, if they didn't think of these things then um, I appreciate all of you bringing them up. Okay, uh, anything else on five? Okay, uh, six, the, um, oh, so Martin, this is where. Yeah, I'm gonna add that. Right, yeah. right. Anybody else on that section? Oh. And how about seven the final one. Oh, i'm sorry selena yep i can go back to six um because sure. i feel like i did understand we heard testimony from marshall about that as a coming thing last week and i under i definitely understood their the reasoning for it and so maybe martin as a nuance to your question is just like what uh, does dps need to take additional um, highway, are there additional highway safety measures that need to accompany that provision if it moves forward? You mean the, uh, the suspension of driver's license or not suspending driver's licenses? Correct. Would DP, but we don't have DPS as a witness today. Right. So we, uh, but well, I we could. We like could. Being channel okay. Questions okay. General. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to get at more nuance than just like, does, uh, is this okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like also like, okay, well, what would, if it, there's concern, what would make it okay? Well, somewhat related to that um, in terms of the fact that uh, restaurants can, um, somebody can order um, liquor cocktails to go with their with their meals. And so the, so the whole open container law, right? It's just out the window. So um, that was interesting. Um, you know, I I understand that that's where restaurants make a lot of their money, but it's it's an interesting interesting one. So 
Um, yeah, I think other states actually have, uh, well, I'm pretty sure New York does, other states have that uh, uh, law in effect all the time where you can take out uh, beer and alcohol from restaurants and bars and that type of thing. So it's almost similar to what they do. Okay. Actually, for, for me, this is helpful to hear everybody, to go through it again and to hear everybody's questions. Uh, so I, I thank you. Anything else? Hi. Yes, Ken. Can we just back up on this, uh, on these landlords thing? What was it? Section, um, the section one. You know, I'm, I'm really concerned um, with the landlords, you know, they're not all rich. And you've got a lot of people that things were running really, really well. And they probably just purchased some property. And now all of a sudden they can't get paid. And that puts them in a bad position. I, I am just really, really um, concerned that, uh, <clears throat> that, that the, the, the landlords are really going to get stung on this stuff big time. I, you know, I realize the tenants are one thing, but I think landlords are very important with this. Right. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, similar to Tom's question, so let's uh, let's make sure we get that answer. Um, okay, Barbara, and then we'll need to uh, adjourn. We're just about at time. Go ahead, Barbara. I think in part of getting the answer that Ken and Tom um, need to hear is what we're doing. Um, sort of tax deferment payments, which could help the landlord. So I think in hearing the economic tools that landlords have access to that um, tenants don't might be helpful for us to hear because I agree, we're not trying to uh, have somebody else bear the burden of the pain. But my understanding was that landlords would be able to make some suitable adjustments that would help them. Okay, thank you. And again, that's something that David Hall uh, could also help us understand in terms of what's being done elsewhere. Okay, so we are at time. Any, uh, Barbara, your hand is, oh, okay, great. So anybody else before we close? Yeah, yeah just a question on uh, when we come back at, what was it, 2.30, I think it was? Yes. Or one, whatever time it was. At, uh, 2.30, yep. I, I just wonder, we, we uh, probably a question for Mike, do we sign back in the same way we did uh, this morning? He, he sent a Buddy? separate sign-in. It's a separate sign-in, okay. Yeah, there's a separate sign-in and link. Okay. Great. So, so I'm gonna email this out momentarily. Uh, and if uh, people, if I've missed, missed it somehow, if you could just no, no. Uh, correct it or and copy everybody again. I think that probably works fine. Great, great. Thank you so much for doing that, Martin. Yep. Okay, all right. Well, I'm actually uh, listening, so uh, then, and, but. I'm sorry, what coach? I didn't hear what you said. We're good. I'm sorry, coach, I didn't hear, hear what you're saying. No, we're good. I, oh. uh, I'm working on a couple of uh, things with ACCD uh, to try to get a couple of answers around the, uh, the landlord mm -hmm. uh, piece. Okay. Uh, because there was some language in the governor's uh, announcements for uh, support for landlords who are supporting tenants. Okay. But I, I'll try to dig that up between now and the next one. Okay, great, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to adjourn and we're going to uh, go off the record and